Panic! Panic! EVs are gonna crash the grid! Or are they? Welcome back to a new episode from us at Best EV. We're asking the question, how will EVs affect the power grids? Surely it's gonna be meltdown and chaos. All that extra power needed will stress the grid, causing blackouts. Well, stay tuned. We're not so sure about that. Let's get into the details. Hey, it's Martin here, and if you haven't already, hit subscribe, hit the like button, and leave a comment below with your thoughts on today's topic. Okay, let's do a quick recap before we get into the nitty gritty. You know, so we're all on the same page. Let's discount hybrids. We are talking today about full electric vehicles, something like the Tesla Model 3 long range, 75 kilowatt hour usable battery, WLTP range, 600 kilometers, 370 odd miles. That's a bit optimistic in real world. Add some temperature and maybe we'll say real world range, 300 miles. National averages for how many miles people drive every year are different all around the world. So we've got to pick a general figure for this video. We're going to say 15,000 miles a year. Now you think that's a lot. May, you may think it's not enough. Let's go with that. The equivalent of about one full charge per week. That's the average. How much electricity are you using with a capacity of 75 kilowatt hours charged 50 times a year, say, that's 3,750 kilowatt hours per year in that Model 3. That compares to a UK national average household of 4,648 kilowatt hours. Now, that sounds like a lot of power just to run a car. So, that gives us some context as we look into whether or not EVs are going to crash the grid. Let's go. Just before making this video, California put out a call to its residents, asking them to cut down on electricity usage at peak times so as not to overburden the local grid. One of the ways called out was for EV owners to avoid charging their cars at the peak time. Now, this prompted a lot of EV skeptics, those media channels I'm sure you can imagine all piled in, highlighting how terrible electric vehicles are. But let's look at the details. According to Bloomberg New Energy Finance research, at peak times, charging an electric vehicle in California is 0.4% of the state's load. Yeah, that's less than half of 1% in California of charging electric vehicles. And even if California hits its 2030, maybe 2035 estimates and has more than 5 million electric trucks, vans and cars on the road, the forecasts are that the peak power usage in California, one of the most populous place of electric vehicles in the world by that time, would be just 4%. Now, that extra load is an issue, but it only materializes if we're talking about peak times. So now we'll talk about demand. Bloomberg NEF estimates that there will be 27 million plug-in vehicles in the world by the end of this year alone. They reckon that the total demand for electricity by those vehicles is about the same as Singapore's total demand, about 0.2% of the global electricity demand. Now take a look at the shining light of EV adoption. That's Norway, where 20% of the fleet is now EV and some months 90% odd of new car sales have a plug, 80% pure electric. Now, electricity demand from all those EVs, even in Norway, only adds 1.4%. And in many wealthy countries around the world, electricity demand is actually falling because of a focus on appliances being more efficient. Here in the UK, we had a big campaign to move all of the lighting to LED. We better insulate our homes and so on. In those cases, EVs are actually offsetting a drop in demand. Here's another way to look at it. Based on the numbers from Bloomberg NEF's analysis, in 2021, China generated 983 terawatt hours of electricity from just wind and solar alone. That's 25 times the amount of electricity consumed by the global fleet of EVs just made by China's renewables. Hey, we're gonna come back to renewables shortly. As we put the pieces of this jigsaw together, we've spoken about demand and peak loads. Now, when the grid is under the most stress, that's what we call peak load. It normally takes place in many countries, many areas, uh, late afternoon into the early evening. There's a spike in the morning when people are getting up, but people tend to get up at 
different times. The window is bigger when they put the kettle on and make some toast for their breakfast. You see, electricity supply and demand is kept within extremely tight margins. It's not like we have a reservoir of electricity waiting to flow into your house or business. The grid operator where you're watching this needs to meet the production with the demand at any given moment to balance the grid. That means balancing the intermittency of solar and wind with thermal, nuclear, or maybe hydro. The thing with cars is that they are static for the vast majority of their existence. Now, there's taxis and buses and delivery vans. They work in vehicles. They're out all day. But for the cars and vehicles that you and I own, they normally sat parked for between 22 and 23 hours a day. Sounds odd when you think about it, but look at the numbers. It's true. So it leaves a huge window of charging. The vast majority of EV owners can easily avoid charging at key times of the day. Also, only a small proportion of EV charging is done at high speed, DC fast charging. The majority is done on slower AC charging at home or when your car is out but it's parked up. Sometimes this charging is spread out over 8, 10 or 12 hours, maybe more, if charging on a slow cable. So we don't often see situations where EVs will cause this massive spike in electricity demand. Okay, so we spent some time looking at the numbers and showing how unlikely it is that EVs will cause stress on the grid. So, is the answer to our big question, will EVs collapse the grid, actually completely the wrong question? Could EVs save the grid? Let's look at some of the ways in which EVs are the solution to some potential problems. Let's start with smart meters. With the rollout of smart meters, EV owners can be incentivized to charge their cars when demand on the grid is low. Why? Well, big drops in demand on the grid are actually a bit of a problem for grid operators. In an ideal world, the grid demand would be a flat line 24 hours a day. But it's not like that in the real world. So they have to build out the grid infrastructure to meet the peak. I always think of the example of halftime in the World Cup final. Everyone stops and either makes a hot drink or opens the fridge, lets all the cold air out to get a beer out of their fridge. So they have to build grids for the absolute peak. But nearly all of the time, our grids don't operate at that demand. So grid operators end up shutting down gas and coal plants so as not to send too much power into the grid. And frequently, they have to curtail wind generation during windy nights because of low demand. And this is where EVs come in and they are the solution. Customers are incentivized to charge their cars in these times. I do myself. My car is nearly exclusively charged overnight, apart from in the summer months here, we have some solar on the roof and any excess will go into the car. But that's more like the icing on the cake, really in terms of how much energy I need for our car it's nearly always charged overnight. And we pay a lot less than our daytime rate. We've seen occasions here in the UK where demand at night was lower than generation. Some people with smart meters on a special tariff were able to charge their cars and get paid to charge their car because it was cheaper to do that than turn off generation. And charging is only the first part of how EVs will balance the grid. The other is where the collective batteries in EVs will be used to prop up the grid in times of need. Consider the Nissan LEAF Plus, 59 kilowatt hour usable battery. It has bi-directional charging on the Chatamo socket. Let's say if you own this car and you know you're gonna need about 100 miles of range the next day, that is to do your commute, all of your journeys and a bit in reserve. Well, bi-directional charges are being rolled out as we speak that take energy from the car and send it back to the grid when the grid needs it. Grid operators incentivize the owners to charge their cars overnight on cheap electricity. Then, the next morning, when there is a peak in demand, rather than that electricity coming from a power station maybe hundreds of miles away, it can come from your neighbor's driveway. And a little bit comes from their car, because your grid operator, your electricity company, will know that you don't need that many miles for your journey that day. EV owners can then be paid for the energy in their battery. It takes a small bit of the power from a large number of EVs to comfortably, what they call peak shave. Shave off that peak of the curve, and actually to the grid operators, that's worth a lot of money. 
EV owners would be paid more than the power than they paid for the electricity the previous night. All of a sudden, the grid isn't hurt by EVs, it's balanced by EVs. And whether you're an EV driver or not, everyone will end up paying less on their bills. So maybe EVs are the solution. Another great solution is for EVs to soak up all those excess renewables. We're seeing some people in sunny climates charge their car exclusively off excess solar that they've installed on their roofs or their homes. And yes, they're driving for free for months of the year on end, which is great for that one person. But what about on a national or international scale? This is where EVs really help in that buffer zone between demand and the variability of renewable energy generation. EVs coupled with smart chargers can be programmed to charge under various conditions. You can program your charger to only send power to your EV when the price falls below a certain signal or when the grid is cleaner. And by that we mean the level of CO2 generated by generating that electricity. And these conditions, when they're met, have a lot to do with excess renewable generation. One example might be a windy night. Everyone's in bed asleep. The wind turbines are going around and the cars are all plugged in at home. The grid is clean. The price of the energy drops because renewables are now far cheaper to put into power grids than fossil generation. And it triggers thousands and thousands of EVs up and down your country to charge up on cheap green lecky. As a result, the grid doesn't have to pay the wind farm operators for energy to be curtailed. The EV owners get cheap or maybe free electricity. And the next day when there's much less demand from electric vehicles, it's a win-win all around. Hey, this is a big topic and I think we'll call it a day on this one that we could go into a lot more detail. As always though, we want to try and give you the information that we need to start the discussion and then carry on having the conversation down there in the comments. We want to hear more from you. Let us know what you think. Do you see EVs as part of the solution? Would you be happy to make your EV battery available? Maybe even just a 10% portion of it to the grid as long as you get paid for the energy in it. We want to hear from you right now. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one.